may fright fiends desire of the gore lord. God to some endeavor to others, but a film buff to all. You've arrived back at my lair just in time as I'm fresh back from a lengthy motorcycle ride and, well, dinner along the coast. You know, my little seaside journey has got me to thinking about an old favorite of mine. A film that would state new claim to both 1980s horror and a vampire subgenre as a whole. Join me now as I sink my fangs into a cyborg soap tale of two wheels, two brothers, and two quarries. Joel Schumacher's 1987 ode to the coming of age, or coming of agelessness. The Lost Boys. Released in the summer of 1987, The Lost Boys is a supernatural black comedy vampire epic starring Corey Haim, Jason Patrick, Kiefer Sutherland, Diane Wiest, Corey Feldman, Jamie Gertz, Edward Herman, Bernard Hughes, and a host of other wonderfully cast actors. We're first greeted with a lovely little flight over the sea, ending up in an amusement park where we see what Looks like a motley crew of sorts, uh, walking along a merry-go-round and looking for a little adventure. Their charismatic leader, David, decides to get all Don Juan de Darko and caress this woman's face at random. Her male companion is, of course, uh, less than pleased. But before he could get even one handful of aquanetted hair, they're subdued by Paul Blart's father. Later that night, we see the portly little wannabe lawman walking to his car after work when... Wait. The door gave way before his arm. Yes. We next meet the Emersons, Lucy, Michael, and Sam who are treating the radio dial like a good blowjob. We're then treated to Echo and the Bunnymen performing the Doors classic People Are Strange as the family enters the fictitious town of Santa Carla and heads towards Lucy's dad's house, where we see that the only thing stranger than the locals is, well, Lucy's dad. Looks like he's dead. They am dead. The boys begin to move in when the 80s strikes again. I haven't seen a TV, Mike. You know what it means when there's no TV? No MTV. Soon after, the boys stumble across Ed Gein's woodshed. I, I mean, Grandpa's taxidermy room, where he goes over the rules of the house and lets them in on something that sounds a bit unique to Santa Carla, but actually really applies to any large town or city. If all the corpses buried around here was to stand up all at once, we'd have one hell of a population problem. The boys go out to the boardwalk and, while being entertained by a oiled up man and painted on jeans, Michael notices an attractive young woman named Star, who with her little companion Laddie, sent Michael into stalker mode. Sam, however, goes into the local comic book store, where he meets the Frog Brothers, Edgar and Alan. Was there a third named Poe? Upon seeing Sam's ridiculous outfit, Edgar asks the obvious. Where the hell are you from, Krypton? They give him a comic book that he has no interest in, and Edgar then tells Sam the same thing Joaquin Phoenix's agent said when they got the script for the Joker. You like this one, Mr. Phoenix? could save your life. Ah, but the couple from the other night is about, and 
they've decided that, you know, even though they've spent their wad on death, it uh, doesn't preclude them from helping themselves to the latest edition of Sod Sack. Meanwhile, Lucy happens into the local video store where she is greeted by Max and his amazing 80s sports coat. She mentions needing work and is offered a job. However, Michael's cruise cruise is going nowhere and he then sees Star joining David and the crew as they jump on their motorcycles and take off into the night. Where we then see the comic Theban duo get well, lifted higher than any meth pipe could ever take them. Soon after, Sam is back at the comic book shop, and he asks the Frog Brothers the same thing that I'd like to ask the staff over at the New York Times. Are you guys sniffing old newsprint or something? They insist that Sam take one of their vampire comics, and while he's busy making friends, Michael bumps into Star and gets to meet her friends, where they decide to blast their bikes down the beach. They race into the night, until Michael is almost run off a cliff, where he lashes out and is then talked to like a power bottom. How far are you willing to go, Michael? Only then he goes back to their cave loft with them and, well, they offer him a questionable smoke and get right inside his own head, uh, toy with his food, and then break a hot bottle of wine. Drink some of this, Michael. Be one of us. After David's Jim Jones impression, Michael drinks and is sucked into a cloud of 80s amazement. Then they're off on the bikes towards an old bridge, and despite the gang wasting no time jumping off the damn thing, Michael joins them and finds they're hanging from the support rods, dangling above a gruesome death. Only one after the other, the gang lets go, and after fighting to hold on, Michael loses his grip and floats back into a cloud of 80s amazement. The next morning, Michael isn't well, and Sam asks him the same thing the Inquirer asked Rick James only a few years prior. Are you freebasing? Inquiring minds want to know. Only later, with Grandpa out on a date and Lucy at work, Michael is worse for the wear. But Sam is busy taking a well, bubble bath, and Michael decides that it might be time to feed. Only Nanook the dog isn't about to let this little bath time buddy of his get hurt and decides to treat Michael the way that I get treated at the end of a night out with my gal pal. Only Sam now knows that something is truly wrong with his big brother and has the greatest reaction ever garnered in all of cinema when it comes to the news. My own brother, a goddamn shit sucking vampire! Will you wait till mom finds out, buddy? But now it's on, and Sam has every right in the world to be terrified. However, before they can pay too long of a homage to Salem's lot, the spell passes when Sam lets Michael back into the house. You see what they did there, the whole invitation clause, and remember that. Sam is soon back with the Frog Brothers and notes that if one kills the head vampire, all half vampires return to normal. He also mentions that things got strange when Lucy took her job at Max's video store and they agree to make like proctologists and look into the old asshole. They seize their opportunity when Lucy invites Max for dinner, and Lucy finally has something to be proud of Sam over. Sam grated the cheese himself. Oh. My son. Only it isn't cheese, it's garlic. And after a couple more failed tests, they realize Max must not be a vampire after all, as he casts a reflection in the mirror and reacts to it the way most mortals react to the Academy Awards these days. Ah! <laughs> Meanwhile, Michael is trying to find Star. Only David tells him that if he wants to see her again, he needs to come along with the gang. 
they go drop in on a little bonfire party where it's revealed to Michael exactly what he's becoming and where David gets to say the same thing that users of truck stop glory holes sometimes get to hear. Now you know what you are. The boys are soon joined by the Frog Brothers and head to the cave loft to put an end to the madness. However, since they don't know who the leader of the grizzly pack is, they decide to commit the mass vampicide and slaughter the whole gang. Only... <laughs> After squirting enough to make Adriana Chechik jealous, the soon-to-be Bill S. Preston Esquire expires. But the others awaken and send Sam and the Frog Brothers flee in terror. Where the Frog Brothers then act like Twitter users after the Musk takeover. We are rabbits in the face of the enemy! It's not our fault! They pull the mind scramble on us, they open their eyes and talk! With Grandpa gone and Lucy headed out on a date with Max, the boys prep for their big post-sunset date with the gang. Where Edgar Frog gets to tell the others about what it's like to have sex with someone on Flacca. Some yell and scream, some go quiet, some explode, some implode. Before long, despite the lack of invite, uh, the gang is upon them and it's time for blood. Will the vampires feed? Will the Frog Brothers hop into action? Will there be any more non-stop squirting? The Lost Boys is a film that changed the game for undead cinema, proving that the creature of the night was one that didn't have to be relegated to Dracula tropes and stereotypes. While a couple of the jokes and references would fall flat today, and some of the wardrobe choices should be capital offenses, in story, structure, and execution, the film is truly a hard one to criticize. After all, it has stood now a lengthy test of time, and is still enjoyed by a growing legion of fans today. A gutsy director, a team of great writers, stellar cinematographers, thoughtful editing, and a fantastic cast makes The Lost Boys something of a movie that will be talked about for decades. I give this classic fangster flick 4 out of 5 Nanook dropkicks. My deepest appreciation to all of you fright fiends who have liked, subscribed, commented, and most importantly, shared these videos. I'm but one lonely old devil, and your help in growing my... awarder... well, it falls not short on this old monster, so thank you. I'm Arlick the Gore Lord, and I'll be seeing you all... sooner... or later. Still of this surprise, I see you.